Uh, Nick, I'd like to begin with um, the essay you wrote on reticence uh, for Heat magazine, because I think uh, the idea of reticence is uh, quite um, uh, crucial to your work as a whole. In that essay, you say that you're attracted to a whole constellation of words which begin with uh, R-E, in addition to reticence, uh, repression, retentive, recalcitrant, reluctant, retiring, reserved, resistant. In a way, that's uh, almost like an ironic self-portrait. I don't know if it was <laughs> intended that way. Um, but there's one word in there I do want to pick up on, and that's the idea of uh, recalcitrant, which is a, a withholding, um, not necessarily um, in an evasive or defensive way, but because there are things uh, to be said that can't be said immediately or openly. Um, how important is that in your work? I, I think... Um for me as a writer, it is quite important um, because I often don't know what it is I want to say directly and I can only arrive at it through a rather roundabout process um, uh, of it partly resisting, you know, the obvious conclusion or the obvious, obvious point and going roundabout um, until I get there. And even then I need a bit of pushing, um, you know, of myself through through rewriting or from other people to really get there. I mean, often I start with um, just an image or a little anecdote or a situation that seems to me to be the, the kernel or something, the seed of something, but I, I can't really say what it is until the writing process happens and then I might get there. But then I don't want to give too much away up front either um, or have too much excess around what I'm getting to, because it might be quite subtle. Is that a deliberate aesthetic uh, of um, understatement or, or of implication? I think it's a, um, it's a fiction writer's aesthetic and maybe a short story writer's aesthetic in particular, um, where you want the point to be made by the, the whole work, you know, so that when the reader gets to the end, you know, they've got what it is, but you haven't had to tell them overtly. Um, so yes, it's a, in that sense, it's, it, it is an aesthetic, or maybe it's a, a poetic idea of some kind. It, I, I did think that. I mean, in, um, in the essay itself, you give two other uh, explanations for uh, being recalcitrant. Um, you cite the position of the foreigner or the stranger uh, who doesn't immediately want to... Um, uh, or can't immediately um, display their own cultural position or their own values and so have to hold them back for fear of being misunderstood mm. or judged. Mm. So I wondered, uh, because the foreigner appears very early in your work, in fact, virtually from the beginning, Yes, um, it may be um, someone from Eastern Europe, uh, yes. someone of migrant background. Yes. Uh, later, um, it's the Chinese, but it can also be um, those who are on the outside for one reason or another. Um, I wondered about your fascination with the, um, with the foreigner or the stranger, uh, because it does seem to me to be tied up with this idea of reticence, your understanding of reticence. Yes, and often um, it's an encounter with someone who, or well, as you say, can't uh, fully express themselves um, on, on the surface of things, but also has, is possessed with a need to communicate. So the role then of the person doing the encountering, you know, the listener or the interlocutor, is actually to listen quite attentively and decode, if necessary, um, and to observe closely. Uh, and it's true, right from my earliest stories in my uh, first uh, book of fiction, which was called The Possession of Amber, there are various stories there of quite oblique encounters between people across age, across space, across um, sort of cultural or ethnic background. I mean, there's one story I remember called Kuji Spring, which is literally just an encounter between a, you know, a teenage boy in Kuji and an old Greek woman who is widowed, I think, or is grieving in some, um, you know, un unnameable way. Um, and they communicate um, by passing each other in the street or by looking at 
you know, at each other um, from one flat to another. And that seemed to me, I mean, that was written quite early, and that seemed to me something quite, quite seminal, partly about um, communication or sharing um, in a, you know, in a in an urban space where everyone comes from somewhere else and has has their different stories. Uh, in in um, in that essay on reticence. Um, you attribute uh, um, reticence to a number of different groups, uh, uh, one of which is Adelaideans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I wondered whether the habit, you know, wasn't, you know, in part cultural or, or you know, part of your background, uh, but also the fascination with the stranger uh, or the foreigner. I wonder whether that isn't also uh, an aspect of uh, growing up in a culture which uh, must have been fairly uniform. Did it have a strong migrant population uh, when you were growing up there? Well, it, it has had. Um, it does have, even now. Um, but the world I grew up in was very um, monocultural in our immediate space. Um, so, for example, we used to um, get takeaway Chinese food from the Green Pagoda restaurant. Um, you know, on the weekends occasionally. And that was quite a big deal uh, in terms of, you know, stepping outside the comfort zone. Um, you know, and it's equally true, I was also always attracted to the people from somewhere else. So I have one close friend from my school days still, and he migrated to Adelaide with his family from Kenya at the age of 14. Um, this is Scott Hicks, the filmmaker. Um, and so he came into the classroom, you know, as someone who had a very different take on the world. And, you know, he was exiled, you know, with his parents to this place called Adelaide and didn't like it very much. Uh, but we, we became very close friends. And Eastern Europeans, um, refugees from here? Well, Tony, refugees. yeah, Tony Hellman was my other good friend at school. Now, his... Um, his father was a doctor in Adelaide. Um, they weren't, they'd, they'd come to Australia um, before the Second World War, Jewish and very actively involved in culture. So I used to go to the opera with him, you know, we were teenagers and his mother would buy tickets for us and, you know, I would, I would get, go with him to the opera and, you know, stay with them on weekends. Um, and he was the first person I knew who read Kafka, for example, as a schoolboy. And so that was a, that was a good influence. Um, it's just, I think, perhaps more than any other Australian um, writer, um, this inquisitiveness or curiosity about um, the foreign or the strange uh, uh, is, is really pronounced in your work. Yeah. Um, and I want to say that actually, because I went to this private all, all boys' school in Adelaide, Anglican boys' school, which gave a lot of scholarships actually. So there were always people there who came from somewhere else, but you didn't quite know where. Um, one from Bosnia, I remember, one from Hungary, and then also occasionally Aboriginal people who, this was never spoken of, um, but, you know, looking back, when I kind of decipher it, I can see, you know, that was happening as well. It must have been very, you know, hard in some ways for them. Because um, uh, you actually wrote a book, um, uh, Black Sheep, uh, which is about the foreign element in your own family. Mm. And that's the, uh, the, the kind of figure from Burulula, uh, <laughs> um, Roger. Roger Jost. Roger Jost, yeah. who it seems what may have been uh, the son of your uh, great uncle, is that right? Your that was a story. Young, yes. Yeah, possible. Yes. And uh, the way you seize on uh, the person you call our mystery relative, yeah. quote, for me, his image became a kernel of fascinated, energetic speculation. And <laughs> yeah. um, that suggests, you know, uh, that the, the foreign is really quite an important element in your work as a mm. kind of germinating or generating yes. Uh, influence. Yes. That's true. And I suppose, I mean, there's another link, I guess, with the great-grandfather who was a missionary in China. So there were these other elements in the family as well, not there just were. simply around it. Certainly, yeah. yeah. Mm. 
And the family was quite mobile in its way. Um, we, when I was a kid, we moved around a lot. I mean, I happened to be born in London because my father was working um, in England at the time. I, I came back on a ship at the age of six months to Adelaide. Then we moved to uh, Taralgon in Victoria and we lived in Broken Hill and we lived in Perth. So all through my years up to about 10, we were always on the move. What um, was your father doing in those places? Well, he was a management consultant, which was a kind of new thing in the 50s. Um, and he was a management consultant to these various companies, including, well, in, in Taralgon, it was a brown coal Mining. mine and in Broken Hill, it was North Broken Hill. And then there were biscuit factories and this and that <laughs> around the place. And then he finally got into um, plastic lens manufacturer, which manufacturing, which was then widely exported. So even in my teenage years, he was always traveling. He was in Asia everywhere all the time and a bit in South America. So even though we were in this uh, sort of enclave in Adelaide, there was always this other stuff going on. And, and I myself, um, I studied German at school, in high school, and won a prize to go to Germany in 1968. So that was before my last year of high school. Um, and as part of that, that, that um, package, we went to Germany and lived with German families. So this was 1968. So Europe was in revolution. Um, but, you know, he was either this conservative boy from Adelaide dropped into these debates with German contemporaries about reunification and the Vietnam War and, um, you know, the, um, I mean, Bader Meinhof was not, not far away. Um, and then we also went to Israel and to India as part of that package, um, which was a sort of negotiated arrangement so he would see the world from these different sides. And, that, you know, I was 16, um, and that was very influential, actually. So it would be wrong to see um, your interest in, in the exotic or, or the strange as a, as a reaction to the uniformity of an Adelaidean upbringing. On the contrary, all these elements are present in, are there, within the upbringing. Yes, if you, if you find them, if you seek them out, um, and I suppose this is where the question of, of affinity you know, or whatever we want to call it, comes in, that these are the things that I'm drawn to, um, or they are sometimes drawn to me. Um, they spark my imagination. Um, they present a question that, for me, can be answered through, through writing. And I, I suppose it does, it does also relate, I mean, what this question of affinity, um, it does relate to perspective and maybe a degree of distance or an angled look at things. Um, I mean, just speaking of that, um, that trip to Germany, one of the first things I wrote was a short story about um, you know, looking down from my window at the snow-covered square and seeing someone um, you know, sitting on the bench or walking along. You know, I wrote a short story about that, so I kind of imagining what might be going on. So imagining um, yourself into this into situation. Into that space, but from a distance or at a sort of an angle. Um, so is that really quite primary for you in terms of imagination, That's it, it, that sort of leap into it, um, it seems to another be. situation yeah. or another character, it, yeah, a different character? Yeah, a different character, yeah. So it's in that sense, I guess, that the... Because you do talk about the, the uh, reticence as... Um, offering double readings of an encounter, mm. uh, registering both the situation and the possibility for the situation to become something different. Yes. And so that resonance, that, that, and, and also presumably the sense of distance yes. of observation yes. is, uh, is crucial. Yeah, but which may be also a, want, a, a wanting connection, you know, across that distance at the same time. So that, I guess, is the double thing. I notice also in that essay on reticence that uh, you talk about shyness mm. a, as a form of, or as a source of reticence and how um, shyness increases the powers of observation because 
you know, one withdraws oneself mm. partly from the situation, mm. from, from involvement in the situation, in order to be able to observe it all the better. Mm -hmm. um, powers of observation seem really strong in your writing to me, um, details especially, mm. um, and especially details of setting. I mean, there's certain key settings, childhood settings, I mm. guess, uh, the setting for um, Paper, Paper Nautilus, Nautilus. Mm. and for Rowena's Field. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And those are settings that exist not only in, in place, but in time. You know, they're often quite far away in time, um, but they can then uh, suggest the story that has evolved over time um, from that place or the, you know, the human and family connections with the place. But it's true, I mean, the starting point for my writing is so often um, an image of a place which I that may then you know delete from the final version, but you know it is a powerful starting point always. And of course, that place doesn't have to be um, Australia or Adelaide. Not at all. Uh, no. On the contrary, it seems people talk a lot about uh, you uh, and China in the same breath, almost as if you were the uh, you know our man. Yeah, from which China. is ridiculous and. Um, as you know, is something that I feel very uncomfortable with and that has only grown over the years as, you know, other possible voices fall away. <laughs> and it seems quite desperate, <laughs> you know, a country like this. But nevertheless, um, uh, can you know, the last... sort of want to put onto one yeah, yeah. sort of poor person this, <laughs> you know, this, this role of speaking. And now that uh, China. Pierre Rickmans is dead, you're, <laughs> you're the new Pierre Rickmans. Yeah, well, it's just mad. Mm. Um, nevertheless, your, your most recent but, books are all all have Chinese settings, yeah. so um, it's not as if you're avoiding it. Or no, like and that. that's, um, I think going back to the question of shyness, I, I do think of myself as a shy person, which may seem implausible, you know, because I'm always talking um, in public about things. Um, but one of the things about, for me, being in China, and this is uh, from the early days when I was learning the language and then my Chinese improved dramatically when I was sort of on the streets of China talking to people, that I seemed to develop a much less shy personality. You know, I just talk to people and I don't really care, you know, if I'm misunderstood, which I often am, or if, if what they think is going on. Um, but there's a kind of another personality um, that emerges for me out of well, probably any foreign language, but that foreign language for me. And I often, I look back to those early classes at the Canberra CAE when I was studying Chinese, um, these sort of night classes with the wonderful teacher, Nancy Lee. And when you're practicing the tones at the beginning, you're like an infant, you know, ma, 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 ma. You know, that's one of the things you're saying, ma, 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 ma. Um, so there's a kind of rebirthing uh, process through entering that language space. Um, and then because in China, people don't really care what you say or what you do, you know, in certain areas, you can just talk to people. Um, and, you know, with quite a lot of energy, it's a kind of unshy, unshying yeah. process when you go up to someone and say, well, what are you doing? <laughs> um, but that, yeah, so there's an escape from, from reticence there. But then reticence is also written into Chinese interactions all the time as a mode. And particularly if you're uh, discussing something sensitive, you know, you really um, go in a roundabout way or you use euphemisms or you use almost non-existent language, you know, and my, the example uh, that always I like about this is um, because I became a diplomat and I was present at some quite high level meetings and on one occasion Sininian Stephen who is the Governor General came to meet the head of the National People's Congress or some such who was a kind of 85 year old former general and um, you know Ninian was very polite and um, very civil but at a certain point raised the question of Tibet <laughs> this old man just said, which means they don't understand the situation. And that was it. You know, Ninian went on, he just said, 
you know, don't understand the situation. So, you know, absolutely drawing a line, but not in a very communicative way. Okay, I don't understand the situation. Well, then explain it to me. Mm -hmm. But no, you know, that was just it. So, um, no, I, I think you're the perfect person to um, appreciate those subtleties of communication uh, in the Chinese situation. I just wanted to refer to the, the story um, uh, Loving China mm. in uh, Bapo, um, where uh, China is, in fact, um, uh, the, uh, the glue, really, which um, uh, under, un underwrites the relationship between um, the young man and the young woman. I uh, quote again, they saw in each other the freshness of hope, belief, commitment, the energy of China, mm. because they both have Chinese interests. Mm. Um, and yet in that story, um, what China means for them and for their relationship changes in the course of the, of the story. Uh, here it's freshness of hope, belief, commitment. Later it's enormity and distance, quote, the questions it asked and the deep answers it gave. Uh, later still it's indirectness and the long view uh, the sense that a thing could turn into its opposite, which mm. is closer to what we're talking mm. about now. And then again, its sensuous lines, the invisible veins of breath, its yielding forbearance of give and take, mm. which is called Ren. For mm. there, there's a whole philosophical underpinning. Mm. Um, so I don't want to ask you, what does China mean for you? Because obviously it has a whole range of meanings. One of the things that happens to people who become involved with China is that they can be swallowed up by China um, or to put that in a more dignified way they decide that their role is to serve China and I've met quite a few cases of that where people say you know the Chinese people need me um, or particularly for Australians perhaps that that if Australia is unappreciative, um, you can go and serve China. And there's a kind of point beyond which people don't return. Now, that, well, that's fine. That's what they do, um, the long-term China expert. Um, in the case of those who, who do return but are deeply engaged, um, it's often quite hard for them to communicate whatever it is about China to everyone else, partly because Australia also wants them to serve Australia's interests in China in a certain way that may not align. Um, or people may just not be very interested beyond a certain point. So it becomes isolating um, to have that, that experience. But on the other hand, in the case of this couple in the story, um, that is what's brought them together. And, you know, that is a wonderful thing. Um, it's the glue in the relationship. And, you know, without that glue, would there be the relationship? It's, it's hard to know. Um, so it, it binds them to each other in their own world. But the question of, of China and how they should sort of behave in relation to it all, um, is there as a kind of ambivalent presence. And if I can switch from the story to myself, because um, that particular story does have some elements that are drawn from life in it. Um, Quite intimate elements, I yeah. should say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like to be able to uh, pick and choose what I do with China um, and there are people who I greatly admire there, who I'm very willing to help. Um, there are ideas and processes happening there, which I think are incredible and, um, um, you know, are world changing in the full sense of that word. Um, and there are possibilities for Australia. Um, and we don't always handle it very well, but, you know, for it's part of what Australia is. Um, and so I'm, I, I enjoy and find it rewarding to engage in those areas, which are mostly to do with sort of literary and cultural artistic exchanges mm. now.
people associate you with China, but when you first started out as a writer, it was Italy rather than China that was the uh, the point of attraction. Mm. I think. Yeah. Can Can you compare those two countries or those two cultures? And I just I'll just say it was quite fascinating. When this when I published that first book of short stories, there were a lot of stories in there that were set. Well, there were some set in Italy. There were some set in um, in the Middle East, in in Egypt, actually, and there were some involving foreignness. You know, a story about learning Chinese um, in Canberra, mm. or a story about um, uh, migrant people in England, and it got a very mixed reaction when that book was published. A lot of people said this is not what an Australian writer should be doing. When was that? That was the 19- it was nineteen eighty, so yes. it was the end of the seventies. So the Australian writer should be doing, you know, what Frank Morehouse um, was doing, you know, which what Frank Morehouse was doing was was terrific in in other ways. But chronicling Australia. Chronicling life, Australia. Yeah. But for me, chronicling Australia also it always involved these other explorations. And then other people got that at the time and said, well, this is something, you know, at the time that seemed new, um, certainly in the short story writing world. Um, so there's always been this um, this kind of this awkwardness or this binary um, in the Australian literary context. I think you know wanting to say, okay, this is Australian, you know, because it chronicles Australian life, and this, it's whether it's Australian. foreign or it's imagined or speculative, is somehow not, not what we want, mm. um, and that continues today. But you um, would argue that that cosmopolitan perspective was fundamentally Australian. I would, absolutely, yeah. And I mm. see all of my work, you know, as, as contributing to that one way or another. Um, you're asking to compare Italy and China. Um, I can find points of comparison, whether, <laughs> whether there's any substance to them. I mean, well, the Italians and the Chinese argue about who invented pasta and who invented ice cream and who invented the pizza and all of these things. They both have food as an, as an absolutely central place in their cultures and food in quite a grounded, earthy way. So it's linked, you know, you think of Tuscany um, and that culture is so grounded in its um, kind of food production, agricultural production, you know. And China um, is a peasant society at its base yes. um, and even though all sorts of structures are erected on that um, that remains strong. I thought the earthiness was definitely one quality um, I think the sense of tradition is another quality mm. and in fact that's um, a quality that you tri- attribute to reticence as well that in a culture where there are a, a strong kind of uh, a traditional understandings you don't have to spell out any everything you can just simply allude to it all. Yes. Yes. Uh, so the sense of tradition seems important to you, I think. They're both very old cultures mm. and old cultures where that, in fact, is a burden as well. You know, they're, they're exhausted cultures in, in one sense, trying to revive, you know, through revolution um, in both cases, actually. Um, I thought uh, the, fa- the fascination with tradition, uh, with traditional understandings, is also a very distinctive um, feature of your writing yeah. for an Australian writer, yeah. where very often the idea of tradition is not. Partly um, that comes from your own family, I guess, because you do talk about them having a strong sense of tradition. Your great-grandfather yes. traced your family back to the doomsday. All of that, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess that's part of it. But in a way also it does seem like a reaction to relatively shallow sense of history or tradition in Australian culture. Is there a, uh, a kind yeah, of... Yeah, I always wanted to scratch uh, beneath the surface because I think there always is a tradition. Um, I mean, it may seem shallow, but if you scratch, there's always something more behind it. Um, and, well, for me, that journey to Borolula, for example, which is um, on the Gulf of Carpentaria, um, was also a um, an exploration of Aboriginal culture, um, past and present, and into its art and literature to some extent. Um, so there, you know, there there is enormous tradition in Australia, but um, we don't always acknowledge it or or understand it. Um, 
And that includes China, actually, as, as, um, as we now see the interaction between um, China, Southeast Asia, Northern Australia, um, Chinese people coming here from early on and then interacting with Aboriginal people and everyone else. You know, it's such a rich uh, story and, mm. and history. I, uh, I, yes, so I've which I've written about. Yes, mm. so I've mentioned the Chinese and the Italian uh, as expressions of, uh, of the other, but um, the Aboriginal should also be mentioned, it's very important for you, I think. Um, one of the six custodians, one of the group of custodians in the novel of that name is Aboriginal, mm. after all. Uh, and um, I think part of the attraction of Roger Jose is that he became Aboriginal in a yes, sense. That's he went, right. went yeah. over at least. Yeah. Married an Aboriginal woman. Yeah. Um, so uh, I just wonder. He was how a you, combo. Yes. And Adelaide is very close. I mean, South Australia is very. is closer, I guess, to the Aboriginal. It feels much closer, yeah. It's, the, you know, it's spoken of as the gateway to the desert. And that is true that um, you go up the road a few hours and you're in the Flinders Ranges and um, a bit further traditional Aboriginal lands. But the people from there all come into Adelaide because it's the only city, you know, for miles around for hospitals or education or whatever. So the connection seems quite direct, actually. Um, I just want to come back to uh, reticence mm. uh, again uh, because there's a third meaning uh, which you attribute to it um, uh, quote the silences of eternity that we imagine but can never quite hear that is uh, <laughs> um, that is you know before certain aspects of experience spiritual aspects yeah. of experience you can only gesture you can't or point you can't actually state mm. um, I wonder how important that is in your writing that spiritual dimension well, one of one of the Chinese ideas that I um, that really resonates for me is the idea of the form and the void. You know, so it comes out in Chinese painting where you have the mountains are painted, but the background is just left. So everything that exists that has a form is also against the void. You know, which is in infinity. Um, so in in circumscribing a the shape of a mountain, you're also um, delineating the void beyond. Um, so in terms of writing, that becomes the blank space on the page, the things that are not said. Um, in terms of spiritual, philosophical belief, probably also, um, you know, there's Wittgenstein, you know, of what we cannot speak, we must remain silent. And I think that is an axi is axiomatic for me. I mean, I think it applies at one level simply to what people don't say about themselves. Mm. But um, your novels are very much concerned with interactions, communications between characters, um, and with their defensiveness and their opening out to each other. Um, I mean, you talk about shyness as uh, reserving itself for the moment when it can open itself to an, to another, to mm. a loved other, mm. and that's characteristic I think of of your stories as well um, so I, I think it's probably at that level that the spiritual is operating a sense of it's not detached from from people being themselves yeah. no yeah and it's always um, liable to have a kind of shaping effect or to exert a kind of pressure which might then lead to something else Mm. Um, a resolution or a transformation of some kind. Um, I'm thinking of here of Paper Nautilus, really, which mm. is a story that goes back in time in a family. Um, but at the at the heart of it is, you know, there are two brothers um, who are both um, in the Second World War, Australian soldiers in the islands. Um, and the sort of the golden boy is the one who actually doesn't come back, who dies. Um, and the one that the family doesn't care about so much is the one who comes back and then sort of lives on with the memory. Um, and, you know, I've always... And then in the end, there's a kind of acceptance. But 
I've always understood that in terms of a kind of spiritual transference that happens in that death, um, which the family then take on um, in some way. And then it leads to a younger generation who know nothing of it and mm. live their lives. Mm. Um, mm. I just want to swing the discussion then to the other uh, side, from the spiritual to the erotic. Mm. And uh, there's this quote, um, the, the evasions that reticence brings uh, are images that advance and recede. A potential persona who becomes present then fades into absence. A possible relationship between persons, eroticized, ungendered, so to speak, an ontological androgyny. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but the word androgyny, I think, is really mm, important key, there yeah. because it's not accidental. In the story mm. uh, Diamond Dog, you know, mm. the uh, communication across um, cultural uh, boundaries uh, between the young girl and the young boy is precisely in these terms. Mm. It's actually cross-dressing. Cross-dressing, The, the yeah. boy dresses a girl, the girl yeah. But, I mean, yeah. that's fundamentally androgynous. So, yeah. in a way, um, that encounter across cultural boundaries is, is an erotic encounter. It's eroticised. Yes. Do you agree with that, that uh, eroticism of that kind plays an important role in your novels? Yeah, certainly. And eroticism is an energy, incredible, a powerful energy. Um, in that story, Diamond Dog, also um, the girl's puppy dog, you know, is swallowed by a python, a diamond half swallowed, python. Half-swallowed, half-swallowed. Half-swallowed, and then she beats it with a stick and yes. it, she saves the day. And partly that's an image of a kind of, you know, the, the alchemical, alchemical transformation, um, you know, of being swallowed by the serpent. Um, and if, you know, we can translate this into Chinese terms of yin and yang, um, the, the male and the female elements and each possesses part of the other and when they're in harmony or when they're in kind of dynamic exchange new things are born mm. and it's mm. good um, but that doesn't always happen sometimes it can be bad um, I mean the erotic is a dark energy as well that can be opening things up to manipulation or um, deception exploitation and that's something I'm also um, have written about in, well, in it's very strong. Ways. It's yeah. very strong in the two stories in Bapo, which have homosexual uh, protagonists. Yeah. So, uh, the desire and the the horror, um, yeah. or the possibility of manipulation, is yeah. very very strong. Yeah. In both of those. Yeah. I I wondered whether in Diamond Dog, you know, uh, that juxtaposition, which is very powerful, of uh, the attraction of androgyny, and the horror of you know the dog half swallowed by the python. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're also giving the kind of emotional extremes of crossing that division, that it is a kind of abomination in a way, crossing, well, crossing from one, one yes, entity to or another. Yes, if not abomination, um, a, um, a, lo a sort of surrender or a, um, a, a kind of loss of self um, into something, you know, polymorphous, perverse, um, Which is, I think, in, can be seen in spiritual terms. I mean, it is a kind of surrendering of the, the self to something larger. It can larger. be, yeah. But it, it can also not be that um, and can also be just a tipping into some sort of manipulation or exploitation or um, a sort of acting out um, of something. Nevertheless, um, uh, the erotic takes many different forms in your work. Yeah. Ménage à trois, yeah. and, um, uh, golden showers and so yeah. on. Um, so there's a kind of, um, uh, I was going to say libertarianism, but the, the, there's a kind of freedom being exercised there in terms of what the imagination can imagine. Oh, absolutely. Well, I would start from that, really, that, you know, sort of anything is possible. Yes. Um, and expressions of, of, of desire or of, of longing or of interaction can take, you know, countless forms um, and in a way have to be explored to see where they might go and some might hit a, hit a dead end, um, others might turn into something else. Um, kind of fluidity that interests me. Yes. And a transformative power, because in those roles, um, 
uh, the agent becomes quite theatrical. Or yeah, can become and there's often role reversal or yes. tables are turned. Yes. Um, it's often quite funny um, or comic the way it evolves. Um, flirtation is an element. Um, Which is related to reticence. It I is, think. exactly. Yeah. Pointing towards other things. Yeah, yeah, putting this out as a possibility but then withholding it. Mm. Uh, but when you were talking about that, the eroticism of um, Diamond Dog, uh, you were seeing it in symbolic terms, mm. uh, east and west and, mm. and so on, male and female. Uh, I guess uh, it's important to remember that you did your doctoral research on the 17th century <laughs> and one of your novels, The Rose Crossing, is set in the 17th yes. century. So I wondered about allegory in your work. Um, did you take from your studies... You know, an interest in the more more um, uh, elaborative or esoteric forms of uh, of st storytelling. Yes, I think so. Well, alchemy, of course, is yes. uh, you know a theme in the in seventeenth century writing, where um, there are symbolic transformations all the time, um, and people actually also want actual transformations. You know, people to become gods, um, shit to become gold. Um, mm. And that can be represented allegorically, um, although how you read the allegory may be quite um, open or enigmatic. Um, one of the things I, I think I do take from that is, um, you know, an interest in um, well, symbolism, imagery that is quite elaborate sometimes, um, or staged in a, in a way that it could be read allegorically. I mean, the Rose Crossing is the most extreme example of that in my books, mm, mm. Um, where you have, you know, they're on an island in the Indian Ocean, there's a Chinese prince, there's this sort of English girl, English princess. roses are being <laughs> hybridised. Um, but it's also there in the red thread, in a sense, in, in as much as the characters are in the present are acting out uh, an earlier story. That's right, yes. Um, so it's got a double dimension. It's both this story and that story at yeah. the same time. And allegory generally has that other layer of significance which um, may or may not be out in the open. Mm. And I wonder if that's, a, is, if that's psychological at a, at a deep level, um, that, you know, the characters are acting out something a shadow um, in themselves or in their past that is, is unresolved but it is sort of a, um, you know, a negative presence of some kind or an unresolved presence. You mean a kind of atavism or, or what? Yes, or um, some sort of more like a psychological burden, or inheritance, um, wound. Um, is there a Freudian word for it? Some sort of trauma. Trauma uh, or family romance um, from, you know, which feels as though it's coming from the past or from some realm of story, but is actually the, their psychological structure. Um, which then is reenacted as they try to move away from it. Um, I feel there's something of that going on. And that takes, you see that as allegorical in some sense? Um, yes, but I also see it as um, emotional, uh, you know, an emotional sort of construction. Um, that is my sense of your work, I guess, uh, when I referred before to. Uh, uh, it's um, uh, the priority of character in the writing. I mean, it's as if the characters have depths to them or um, rooms in their yes in their psychology that um, your your intent really on opening opening out, out yeah. And then and so find the story is a way of of doing that. I mean, if you think of the custodians, what happens on I think page one of the custodians is that um, the, the young boy in Adelaide um, 
has dug up an Aboriginal skull, mm. you know, which is in the cupboard. I mean, putting it like that, it sounds, I mean, totally allegorical, but not implausible, emblematic. Not implausible for that period. Not that implausible time, for yeah. that period at all, no. Um, and this is a source of unease really throughout his then life, you know, his life as far as we follow it. But that's compounded by another unease, uh, the fact that his mother threw the, um, the skull threw out along out. with his other belongings. Yes. So um, uh, there's a resentment against the mother, yes. which is overlaid over this other. So That's right, yeah. You would see that as fairly typical then in some ways, or characteristic of, I would. of your conception of, uh, yeah. of character. Yeah, and he, it sort of strips him in a sense of one set of possessions or one identity, and therefore he has to form another um, through, through struggle, through work, through going out and encountering um, and through friendship. Through friendship. So I wanted yeah. to talk about friendship, because yeah. that seems really important, yeah. crucial to your notion of China, since so many of the, of the, the China stories are about friendships of one mm. kind or another, most explicitly, I suppose, in Donkey Feast, which mm. is about, you know, reunion of friends. Um, but again, in The Custodians, where... Uh, which is about a group of friends from school days yes. who end up, you know, in really important positions in Australian culture. It's as if friendship was the kind of generator of um, cultural relationships, mm. uh, of um, ideas of the nation and of the culture at large. Is that how you see friendship? Do you place an enorm important importance on it in those terms? I do. I think, um, you know, friendship is... Um, a powerful and important um, and I feel really close to and sort of bound to you know the people I regard as f my friends um, what is friendship um, it it's something that can endure it can last and that's one of the powerful things about it um, across you know long periods of time and space friendship can can last but friendship can also just evaporate um, or turn into something um, you know opportunistic or uh, you know manipulative um, so friendship isn't a solid thing necessarily no. um, but it is it's based on what is it based on um, affinity coming back to that word, affinity between people, something shared which does involve a commitment um, even to, you know, go with a friend into some unknown territory. Um, is, it, is there an element of, of kind of fate or destiny about it? I think maybe for me there is. Um, a, a Chinese person asked me, well, what do you mean by friendship? And there is a Chinese word, yuanfen, which means something like it's fated, a fated affinity, um, you know, elective affinity is Goethe's phrase, which I've always, I find an incredibly resonant phrase. Um, but that ele elective affinity, affinity, which is also somehow destined um, and becomes part of the fabric of your life, um, I find that a powerful idea. Um, and yeah, it's something that I have, I have written about a lot, um, in, in various forms. Uh, I, um, in addition to what you've said, it seems like friendship is a repository of, um, memory and shared experiences yes. and in that respect and shared understandings too. And in that respect, it is, uh, a place that you can return to or a situation you can return to in order to draw out things that haven't been said before. Yes. And, you know, it transcends shyness and reticence and those things because the things are known already. Yes. And if there has been some um, trauma or tragedy in the past, the friendship somehow contains that and um, moves on from it. Uh, in a way, um, 
you know, there can be a work of mourning, in other words, in friendship, um, which can be healing as well, um, you know, to speak in, in kind of psychological terms, um, which is something I feel. Um, There's also the drama of um, a friendship achieved across differences, mm. uh, which is particularly the case where you've got someone from Australia and someone from China. Yeah, the drama of that, the drama of um, a friendship where something is also at stake or, you know, a friendship that's going wrong um, is also is also interesting. Um, there's a kind of also a question of, well, what limits are there to friendship? What lines do you draw around it? You know, when does a friendship become eroticized to go back to that or not? Um, and betrayal. And betrayal, <laughs> yes. The other Ab side of friendship. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Which is something I've, I'm very sensitive to, I find, and, you know, I'm quite unforgiving. <laughs> <laughs> in my personal life. Well, that's good to know. Too much betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> I've got um, one more question. And I think that just to stay with that for a second, it also then translates into the political sphere, I think. Um, in Australia, I think I, you know, I have a sense there of things that, I've, that I value and are loyal to, which is often things that people have tried to do and then other people destroy them or disregard them. Um, so my kind of political antenna is quite related to a sense of things I feel, you know, loyalties mm. and affinities I feel or feel are threatened. I felt that very strongly. I mean, there's a number of tributes, tribute stories in Bapo, but uh, I felt it most strongly in that story, which is a tribute to your uh, one-time agent and very close friend, mm. Rosemary Creswell. Mm. Um, it's uh, it's not easy to to write a tribute, I think, to a, to a friend in fictional form. Mm. That works really well. Well, I have one more question, if that's okay, and that is, since we're uh, talking about you know your work as a whole, really, um, uh, how you feel about uh, your writing at this stage, looking back as a, as a body of achievement, as a corpus. Is there any? Do you have any thoughts about that? I, I don't see it as finished, <laughs> I would say, for, for starters. We haven't talked at all about my essay writing or non-fiction writing, mm -hmm. which um, I see as quite continuous with the fiction in many ways. Um, and the essays often have a personal voice and they're often, um, you know, they play with some fictional elements. Um, I don't have a... I mean, the work all comes from me and some of it I regard more favourably than other parts of it, I guess. Um, I'm interested in what other people would make of it and what threads people will find through it and what will seem extraneous. I think um, that's something that may come in the future. Um, right now... Um, I mean, Bapo has been a, a great experience because actually, interestingly, it's taken pieces that um, might look disparate, um, you know, that have arisen on this or that occasion. Um, but, but in the process of becoming a book, um, and I see this from people's reactions to it, it's become something else, um, maybe something larger or something that asks different questions um, and that is very pleasing to me because I am interested in the blurring of boundaries between literary forms and you know different ways of writing and so on um, and that's what I've been playing around with in the last 10 years or so not in not as a an agenda but it, it's just what's happened and Barpal shows I think how that can coalesce into into something new. Um. I think that's striking because uh, earlier comments about your early writing, the novels tended to stress their conventional character. Mm. Um, 
and I think you know the stress on character and setting um, and a plot which serves character development mm. does give it you know a kind of conventional mm. quality. Mm. Um, but what you're saying is that with these more recent works, uh, the, there's a kind of um, loosening of the form, mm. sort of kicking away of some of the scaffolding, perhaps. Um, we also haven't talked about your writing about art and your role in um, a, as a kind of mediator in Australian art. Do you want to say some things about that? Um, we've talked about affinity and friendship, and that's something that I extend to my engagement with um, with cultural products. I mean, with literature for a start. You know, I'm I'm conscious of being quite eclectic, but also having a, a pretty strong sense of where I find an affinity, where I find a generative influence in the writing of, of someone else from, from any time and place, but including contemporary Australia and contemporary China in that. Um, visual art as well. And I've been involved with contemporary Chinese art um, more or less since it began, you know, in the 1980s when I um, was in Beijing and partly because of the language barrier um, it was I could seek out artists and look at their work and think wow you know you are saying something that no one else is saying here and that really speaks to me and at that time it didn't speak to the Chinese art experts either it just sort of it spoke to me um, so that was powerful communication and quite a few of those people have gone on to have um, you know successful careers um, and I'm not an artist so how do I respond to that um, well one way is to write about it and I've written about artists um, in fiction um, in Bapur there are some stories about artists um, I've written essays, catalog essays and that kind of thing, introducing their art and trying to explain it um, to, to people outside China, to people in Australia um, who have been very receptive. That was a freeing up as well because it was a non-academic kind of writing. I'm not a trained art historian or anything. I just write you know, what, it, what it means to me. Um, but I think that was probably a necessary part um, of... Um, creating space for those Chinese artists in Australia, um, the writing about it um, in a communicable way. Um, but I do feel that there's a continuity between your writing about Chinese art or European art for that matter and your own aesthetic uh, in, in the writing of your fiction. Um, for example, your essay on Morandi, yes, exactly. which is about reticence yep, it is. <laughs> and, yep. about, and about the telling object. Yes. And you're writing about And Chinese. about the bittersweet, um, that, the Morandi, yes. a squeeze of lemon, I think it's called, or yes. something like that. Yes. Mm. And also its attentiveness to history, even though yeah. your Morandi is just uh, in the kitchen, basically. Yeah. Um, uh, but he's know, embedded in life. a moment in yes. you know, Italian history. Uh, and I felt that's true of your writing about Chinese War. art as well. Yeah. That um, it's 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 larger resonances and it's social uh, uh, connotations that really what interest you. Yeah, it, it's certainly embedded um, in the lives of its maker, but also the the wider society. And I guess you know I have that um, what do you call it um, cultural materialist kind of historicist, a sort of um, you know bent to the way I see things. So an object isn't only the object, it comes from somewhere and it's taking those energies and that understanding or that critique and giving it an aesthetic shape which then speaks out to other people in other places. Uh, but that requires mediation as well. Um, very often in my writing, we, I said before that place was a starting point, but very often it's a visual. Image. An object. An object, yeah. 